I asked my wife, what, what, what do you mean exactly? Tell more about myself. And she was, you know, like, I don't know exactly. Tell them your name, your age, and the number of kids that you have. So I went along and I created a web application in Elm that tells you my name, my age, and the, the number of kids that I have. And, you know, it took me a lot of time. I've created, uh, you know, the entire application and the GIFs and the videos and the presentation and whatnot. And after many, many hours, I've decided to show it back, uh, to show it to my wife. And when I showed it, uh, this, uh, GIF, uh, this GIF, the only thing she had to tell me was, you idiot, you're only 37. So <laughs> even though it's biographically incorrect, I'd still like to proceed with uh, the presentation. So indeed, my name is Amitai Burstin. I'm the CTO and co-owner of Gizra. We're a web development shop uh, based in Israel. And since the beginning of 2016, we have an official US office. <laughs> so my Twitter handler is Amitaibu. So if you want to tweet, go ahead. It makes me feel important. So today I would like to talk about Elm, which is basically a different approach to web application. But let's start by understanding what problem it solves. So you can agree or disagree, but one of the problems I call it, this is where you might disagree, of all JavaScript framework is what they have in common is they, they are all written in JavaScript. And that's fine if you're a JavaScript ninja, which nobody is, or there are very, very few. And when I'm going to show you about Elm, so oftentimes people say, so what's wrong about JavaScript? I think there's a lot of things that are wrong. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into the argument of the JavaScript ecosystem and the fact that two, two days ago we had Grunt and yesterday we had Gulp and today it's cool to use NPM script and finding what the real best practices are. But rather I want to show you a pragmatic approach or our own approach in Gizra, which is basically saying, we want to build web application the quickest way possible, the cheapest way possible, solid web application, and also keep our developers' morale high. So in this, uh, uh, in this session, I'll probably be bashing Angular 1 a bit just because you know it's so popular to hate Angular 1. I have nothing really against it. I'm just going to show it, uh, uh, the mindset that I at least know of Angular 1 and how it corresponds uh, in Elm. And basically, just to show you, how I think that Elm provides better tools to uh, deal with front-end development. So Elm is a, function, a functional programming language. If you know what functional programming language is, good for you. If you don't know, we'll cover some, some of the things. In general, the gist of it, I would say that function, the function that we have don't have state and data is immutable. That's probably the two important things that we have. So what you can see on the screen, it's the code. This is, uh, this is Elm. It looks uh, similar to Haskell in case you've, uh, you've seen Haskell. It's a compiled language. It's being compiled into HTML, Java, and CSS. It doesn't mean you cannot use Bootstrap or Semantic UI. You can. But if you want to have some inline CSS or stuff like that, you can do it. So we have the Elm language. And along that, we have also the Elm architecture, which is basically a set of best practices on how to, how to come and how to uh, structure our application, uh, our application, how to connect the different components. And basically, we know MVC, model view controller, in, in Elm, in the Elm architecture, it's pretty similar. We have the model update the view. We'll see a few code examples that will explain that. And basically, the Elm architecture have a few principles. I just want to share with you the two important, uh, two important principles. So the first principle is saying we have a single source of truth. And the entire state, our entire application in held, is held in one single record tree, in one big object. And when I, saw that, uh, when I saw that for the first time, it really resonated with me, if that's even a thing that you say in English. Because in Angular 1, if I would ask you, where is your state, you'd probably you know, scratch your head a bit and you say, well, it's in the UI router or in the router. But then you remember that you have a few services, and each service you know, can have its own internal cache. So you don't really know where, where 
you don't really control the entire state of your application, or you cannot control it easily. Add on top of that the fact that the, the async nature of JavaScript, and again, it's really, really hard uh, to know what is the condition of your web application. And definitely we're in cases of bugs, and we have a lot of bugs in front end just because it's so hard, it's really hard to reproduce, it's really hard to reproduce those, uh, those problems. So this idea, this principle of having everything in one single record tree is maybe counterintuitive to the fact that we are thinking, well, everything should, you know, separation of concerns, everything should be completely separated. So yeah, the Elm, Elm architecture is still saying everything should be separate. There is, there is still a separation of concerns, but still the entire state is held in one single place just to help us control our web application. The second principle is that state is read only. And you know, folks, it's 2016. We all already understand that the root of all evil in this world, this heartwarming, positive, non-cynical world, is two-way data binding. And you know, you probably remember yourself. Thank you, Josh, for laughing. <laughs> Mission accomplished. I remember yourself, myself going into Angular one site three and a half years ago and you know, checking the first example where you fill in the input form and it shows you your name, hi, and your name. And I told myself, oh my god, Amitai, this is saving me so many jQuery lines. And you know, that thing that made us love uh, uh, Angular one so much is the thing that we now uh, hate it for, this two-way data binding. Because we have a big problem. If we have this model view controller thing, with the two-way data binding, our view, our HTML is actually changing our model without necessarily the controlling being involved over there. And when the model is changing, the data is changing, it might cause uh, a, a effect of triggering other action, other changes. And again, we are not able to control or understand the state, the condition of our web application. So back to our award-winning web application, which is basically a glorified counterexample. I'd like to think that maybe I'm the first that was able to personalize a counterexample. <laughs> but it's a counterexample, my friends. And I'd like, to show you through, I'd like to show you some code and basically to show you how we are thinking Elm. So definitely you don't need to understand every single line and command over here. And definitely there is a learning curve to Elm. I know I, when I saw the Elm syntax for the first time, I closed it and I didn't go back to it for, for three months because it looks a bit daunting. But I'll show you how things are making sense. So even if you don't know Elm, I'll show you how things you know, fall into their, their right place. So this is the code that we have, and I'll just go over it very quickly. There is some boiler code that I'm not showing you. I'd just like to show you the essence. So we have a model called person. We have a bunch of import stuff, like you know, in JavaScript we have this re require thing, but let's go to the interesting part. We have here the model. Our model is basically just a record holding a few stuff, like the age, which is an integer. Now this is a compiled language. It's a statically typed language, it means Age can only get integers. There's no way you will be able to pass a string into, into the age just because the compiler will not, will not let you do it. This is part of the guarantees that Elm brings with itself. There are no runtime errors. There are no crazy things that you suddenly don't understand. How come you have a string being pushed into an integer? So we have the age, which is an integer, the kids, and the name. And in the initial, initialized model, I just initialize a bunch of, of, um, of values. Watch me as I quickly completely ignore the init function. There, we ignored it. And we reach this line that fills me with total joy. And in effect, maybe I could have stopped the presentation right here. And if you're coming for React Redux, it, it might make sense, because again, Angular 1, I'm looking at you. If I would ask you about your fairly big, but not too big, Angular 1 web application, what are all the options, uh, all the actions, sorry, a user can interact with your application and that they will change the data? Meaning, what are all the actions? Now, if you're a senior developer and you started the project, well, maybe you, know, you remember everything, but still you won't feel too confident. You'll have to go into the code. You look some stuff inside the controller. You look some stuff inside the view because it might be changing the model. And you come with a list and it's not, well, you kind of hope, cross your fingers, that the list is correct. 
And the beautiful part over here is, you know, our glorified counter example. This is just a counter and example. I can increment and decrement it. I've just created a new type called action, and I'm giving it these arbitrary words, which are decrement and increment. And I know exactly where to look for when you'll ask me, hey, Amitai, what are the different actions you can do for your web application? I have one single line that tells me, not more, not, not, not more than that, not less than that. So below that, we have this update function, which is kind of the controller for, that we know from MVC. So let's look at the type signature. So the type signature basically helps us, helps us understand that I'm going to get an action, I'm going to get a model, and then I'm going to return another model. So Elm is immutable language, meaning I got a model. I'm not going to, I cannot reassign values to it. I'm actually creating a new model and handing it back. Let's completely ignore the effects that we see below that. So now the update function is getting an action and a model, and I have a case over here, case, action, off, decrement and increment. I cannot write anything else. I cannot have a typo. The compiler will not allow me to have a typo over here. The compiler will not allow me to forget to write the word uh, increment over here. So it's guaranteeing that all the cases are fulfilled. And basically, inside the case, you can see I'm saying, take the model and take the kid property and just decrement it by one or increment it by one. All right, that's our view. So it might have some certain resemblance to HTML. I know that, I, I know that when I saw that for the first time, that was like, that's when I decided to close Elm for the first time because I said, hey, Where's my HTML, right? Like, it's, it's really hard to, to read the syntax. It has its advantages, it has its disadvantages. In short, I will say you, it just syntax, deal with it. The disadvantages are probably that it's less readable because we're used to reading HTML. The, the advantages are these are functions that are compiled, so I cannot have a div with a, with a typo, I cannot have an unclosed tag, and so on and so forth. So basically what we are seeing here in the view function, we have we have the div, which is like the root div, and below that we have another div, completely ignore the text, we don't care about it, and then I see I have a name, plus plus, which is basically just concatenating a string, which is the model name. And below that I have the same thing, which is an age, and since age is an integer, I'm just casting it into two string, and you know, I got it, and the same thing for kids number. Below that I have a button, which basically we're saying on click, just send one of those actions that we've set already, the decrement, the increment. We cannot have anything else. The HTML, the view part, isn't changing our model. It is basically saying, take the action, take the model that we have right now, send it to the update function, which is like the brain of our, our web application. This is where all the business logic is being handled. We're just sending it, and changes should be done there. So we have the increment and decrement, and then below, just some, some debug code. But even though it's not HTML, sti still it's a bit, it's quite convoluted. We can probably clean it. And by cleaning it, we can actually show that everything in Elm is actually a function. So what, I've, what we've done over here, the view name is actually, I can declare a view name. I have a function. It's getting a string, and it's returning an HTML. So this is basically just getting the name, at it, at, and it knows how to print it. So if I'm going up, I can see that the view name is now getting the model name. Same thing would be with age. The view age, if I'm looking at the function, so the signature will be an integer, and I'm just getting an HTML. And by the way, I'm writing it, I, I, when I'm writing the type signature, I, sh I don't have to. Elm is inferred typed, meaning it can, it can understand by itself, but this is kind of a best practice for us, the humans, to understand what's going on. So with the view age, basically, view age, I pass it the model age, and here, our web application is perfect. It is showing my name, Amitai, my age, and my kid's number. Oh, no. How embarrassing. I have a bug, and in front of such a respectable audience, <laughs> the number of kids is wrong. And we can see that in the debug, if you can see from that far, the age is 38, the kid is three, and the name is Amitai, but somehow the kid's number is appearing incorrectly. If we go back to the code, we can actually see that I wasn't very concentrated probably when I created the web application. 
the view kids, which is also getting an integer, we are passing it by mistake, model age. So one of the things that Elm allows us, since it's a compiled language, a statically typed language, is to try and move the runtime mistakes into compiler errors. And I don't call it runtime errors because, again, there are no runtime errors in Elm. <laughs> what? Did I miss something? That there are no runtime errors. OK. It is, but, it, but it's true. So our idea is try to shift as much as possible this, this, those mistakes that we are, we are so used to pushing into production and just have the compiler you know, bark at us and say, this is wrong. And in order to do that, we need to understand types. So let's have a quick types one of one. Here is, the types here is the type Boolean. This is how it's defined in Elm. It can get either a false or a true. That's it. If we wanted to extend our uh, fancy web application and I wanted to share with you the different vehicles that I might, I might own, and again, since I'm the CTO of Gizra, I'm so rich, I might have a boat, one boat, I, I don't want to exaggerate, I might have a plane, one pay, but I might have multiple cars. I actually have two. I want to sell one. I don't know how to do it. but. <laughs> Basically, I have this integer of the car. The integer is wrapped with a car type. It's not just a simple integer. So down in my model, I would say the name and the age and the kids, and then I'll have another vehicle property, which is basically a vehicle type from now on. So then we can start once we understand types. That's it. You understand types. We can talk about type safety. So once we have the type safety in place, we're basically helping the compiler in helping us and preventing those mistakes. So again, looking, looking at our previous example, how it looks right now, the age and the kids are both integer. If I go down, I can see that I'm just initializing with normal numbers. A possible solution would be just defining, here I have this new type kids, which is just it's just the kids, right? It doesn't get, it's not like the vehicle, it's not or a plane or uh, a boat. It's just kids, but what's important is we have an integer and that integer is wrapped with the type kids. So just for the sake of the example, I, I kept age as an integer and kids is now of kids type. So if I look at the initializing model, then you can see the age is being initialized with a simple integer, but the kids is initialized with the integer wrapped with the kids type. So the view kids function, for example, if it used to get an integer up until now, this is before the change that we want to add, here is the new change. If you can see in the type signature, you can see that it's no longer going to get an integer, it's going to get this kids type. This is basically, again, our value wrapped in something. So we need to unwrap it. In our, our let, there is a let block over here. Basically, we are, you know, reaching inside and yanking out, unwrapping the kids, and now we have inside this val, inside this val uh, uh, variable, we have our integer, and we can print it. We can print it out. Just to show that there is a possibility again to keep it a bit shortened, and in our argument uh, over here on top, we actually already unwrapped it, so we keep it a little more readable. But the fun part here is once we've done it, once we have this type safety in place, if I'm looking at the compiler, this is actually uh, the integration of the Elm compiler inside Atom, the compiler is actually telling me, hey, you cannot do that. You cannot call now view kids with the model age, and the compiler is actually telling me, I'm expecting, the function is expecting a kids type, and you're passing me integer. And this is beautiful because it will never reach production because, you know, it's not, it wouldn't, it wouldn't compile. So the update function, very similar to that. We're seeing it, this is the before change. We can see that the kids is treating the model kids as a, as a normal integer, as a normal number, but it is not. The, our number is wrapped in that, in that type, so the change would look like that. Again, I need to unwrap our value, and then here the kids, you can see, maybe you can see there is a small apostrophe. This is quite common in immutable language. It's saying, I took the value from kids, but I'm doing some kind of computation, right? I, I couldn't reassign kid itself because it's an immutable language, and then I will reassign and then I will reassign it. 
So basically, the app that function, and that's, that's the fun part. I mean, the, our entire business logic is being done here. Again, if we're thinking about Angular 1, when you have bugs, suddenly your data, something on the screen is, you know, not working properly, you need to start digging and thinking, where is this data changing? You don't have to ask yourself that in L, because there is one single place that it can happen, and that's in your update function. So obviously, it makes it much easier to pinpoint bugs and fix them. And we could have more complicated uh, requirements. I want to show you a more complicated requirement. Just to, uh, um, I, I just want to put it in context, just so the next requirement won't sound uh, too harsh. It's, it's a very short video. Try to notice the sound of the piano in the end. It's, I think it's my own favorite uh, uh, part. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I'm able to make it work from here. Haha, <laughs> plan B. So the next requirement is putting limits on kids. Because, <laughs> and by the way, Aya, that's the name of the girl that was crying. She was basically throwing a fit for 30 minutes because she was annoyed by the fact that the, the, the yellow potato head glasses didn't fit her better. And like, I, <laughs> it just won't, I'm sorry. So we want to put the limits on the kids, uh, like logical limits when we hit the decrement so it won't go below zero, and if we uh, hit increment, it won't go beyond a certain number. Now, again, Angular 1, how would, you, how would we do it? Would we disable the HTML just to prevent the clicking? That, that's like, it kind of sounds wrong, sounds wrong, right? It's dealing with the HTML. It doesn't deal with the data. How would we do it otherwise in the controller? Maybe listen to the model changing and either prevent it or, or, or revert it. We don't have that problem in Elm because we don't have the two-way data binding. This is data is flowing to, to, uh, uh, through a single direction. This is the unidire unidirectional uh, approach. Like we said earlier, the view is just sending the current model with the action, and then it's up to the update function to decide what to do with the action. If it decides not to do nothing, it won't do nothing. So indeed, this is before the change. We can see that. You know, when we're hitting decrement, then we're just decrementing without checking anything. The entire change that we need to do, sorry, the only change that we need to do is add an if over here. So if the value is reaching a certain amount, we'll, then we'll just return kids zero. Again, not just a zero, a kids zero, same thing if we're going to do it for, for the increment. So. Business, logics, bu business logic requires testing, right? Type safety cannot uh, always save us. We saw, for example, the if, then, for, for, um, for putting a limit. And it requires testing. So for the audience, who writes unit tests in JavaScript for their own web application? All right. Now another trick question. Who enjoys doing that? So for the viewer, viewers at home, uh, very few people raise their hands, and I cannot blame, her, cl blame them, because writing unit tests for JavaScript, you probably have the same amount of joy and happiness those guys in the back of Kim Jong-un must be feeling, right? So, <laughs> a unit test in JavaScript, it is uh, so much uh, fun, right? Everybody, everybody hates it, right? And 
And to understand what makes unit tests really easy in Elm, it's probably time to talk about few, pure functions and side effects. So, pure functions and side effects. Elm is a black box, right? It's, it has no connection to the outside world. So if I'll tell you that an HTTP request is the outside world, it kind of makes sense, right? I need to call some server. It's, but it's more than that. Even getting reading the URL from the address bar, this is the outside world. Even getting the time and date from, from the browser, this is the outside world. And this basically, all those things, we call it effects. Or now, today, today uh, the, the new version of Elm was really so from now on we call it comments. Those, those effects or those side effects live outside of, of Elm. So, so if, we're if we're looking at this code, again, back to a simpler counterexample where our model is just the integer, just, you know, number one or two, we could, we could have, let's say, an action saying, and, 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 and one, sorry, to get our uh, counter information from the server, then, uh, then our action would look like that. We'll have the type action again, and, and we'll have two actions. One is calling, calling in the HTTP request, get that server, server, and once we got it, we'll have a second action, and nothing happens by itself, we wire, wire everything together, which will be called be called update that server, server, which will get a certain number. This, no, this code, I kind of, I kind of simplified from rather need to the but just, just for just for you to so let's say, let's say I'm, inside, I'm inside, inside, I'm inside, inside the function, 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 and we can and see, we can here, see that here that this is the action, the action call, get that, get that server, 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 I'm not, I'm not doing anything fancy, fancy with the model, model, however, however I'm, I'm doing the HTTP get, but what I'm trying to understand is that there is no original HTTP going on here, like, it's simply not calling anything, this is kind of a, kind of a, to do, to do, for the Elm run, Elm run. Like if you have your own New Orleans, uh, uh, New Orleans, New Orleans uh, to do uh, list and you write yourself, you know, you know, let's get drunk on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. New Orleans. The fact you wrote it doesn't make you drunk on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. You literally need to, you know, stand up and go all the way. So it's just, just, it's just a to do. Basically, Basically when the web app will be executed, then the Elm run time up will when it will reach that piece of code, it will say, oh, now I need to do the actual request. And this is the idea of having this pure function. And another, another uh, obvious benefit from that, or not obvious benefit of having this pure function is, one of the things, that the reason why we hate write, writing unit tests in JavaScript is that you need to mock the entire world, you need to jasmine catch HTTP and whatnot. You don't need that because there is no HTTP calling when you're gonna unit test those functions. So now if we're looking at update data from server, we can see that, again, we have a case over here if everything is fine, then I'm, uh, then I'm just updating my model. If something is wrong with my HTTP, I'm getting an error. And this is where Elm, it, it doesn't even encourage us, it forces us to be better developers. Because if I wouldn't add this error case, it just wouldn't compile. So honestly, if I had to write it in Angular 1, I would probably cut corners and I'd say, yeah, I mean, why would the HTTP request won't work, right? What can possibly go wrong? And I will just completely avoid it. But Elm doesn't let me do it. So just for the simplicity, I'm not do, I mean, my return value is nothing. I got a model, I'm, I'm returning it. But confronted with the fact that I already had to write this error, error handling, I would probably tell myself, well, let's invest a few more minutes, a few more hours, I don't know, in, you know, providing a better error mechanism, showing a message, or whatnot. All right, headless Drupal. So I, I literally look, looked for the, uh, in Google Images, I, I looked the word ISIS, and that way, that's one of the first images that came in, and I said, like, it's perfect. It's showing everything that I want to show about headless Drupal. I'm not even sure myself, I totally understand it, but it's like, it, it, it just made sense. <laughs> so, Drupal. I mean, it provides us, you know, users and permission and content modeling and entity reference and RESTful and, and, and whatnot. So we decided, yeah, we want to still use it. We just want to replace our Angular. We just want to replace uh, our uh, uh, React with something else. So one of the first uh, experiments was our uh, office time watch. Pretty simple, every, this is, uh, 
the Israeli law forces that every, every employee that comes to the office, they need to write their PIN and they're getting, you know, we're just registering when did they came in and when did they come out, nothing too fancy. However, what helped us, what helped us, sorry, decide to transition from Angular and actually to jump over React was Headly, El um, Elm Headly. So if you're already familiar with our Headly uh, project, we have Generator Headly, which basically scaffolds an entire working uh, headless Drupal installation. So you just write yo Headly, and it just, you know, drush, it, it creates your uh, Drupal scaffolded, it is, sorry, scaffolding Drupal, it's installing it, NPM install, Bower install, creates an Angular application, and basically it's a fully working headless Drupal. It already comes with BHAT test and Travis integration, basically everything that, that you want. So we just told ourselves, okay, let's try to replace the Angular one and basically create a typical web application, that one that has login, and logging with, web, uh, with logging with GitHub and a routing system and maps and user interaction to filter the events and an article that I can easily drag and drop files and upload them and create an article on the fly. And the cool thing is that all those applications, you can already use that in your own existing Drupal site. So it doesn't even necessarily need to be uh, a fully you know, headless Drupal, it can be a hybrid side that Drupal itself is uh, serving the page and you have this Elm web application inside, uh, inside the pages. And first of all, I think it's a pretty cool demonstration of, 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 of capabilities. And if, if, even if you're not wowed, that's fine. I mean, I won't take it personally. And in a, in a way, it's okay because this is a typical web application. I mean, I di we didn't de deliberately try to do something extreme, we wanted to see can we, you know, get all the nodes and permission and OG and, and whatnot, everything is like, we don't care about it, this is just restful serving the information. So if you want to start interacting uh, with Elm and everything that I'm saying is kind of right to Elm 0 0.16 and today was really 0 0.17 but still you can, uh, you can uh, look at the, the, the thing, so obviously you can go to Elm that uh, dash lang org, and I'm pretty happy to say that the second example that appears in the homepage belongs to Gizra, which is this um, Headly, uh, Headly example. Another thing that we've done in Gizra is a, another Yo generator for, um, for uh, Elm, which basically scaffolds a very simple counter example, but it comes with Gulp and browse, Browser Sync and SAS, and you can you know, push to GH pages, and basically it scaffolds everything that you need, and it's already connected uh, uh, to Travis. And you can read different blog posts. Some of our blog posts that we are writing, we're always trying to provide blog posts, blog posts that are um, pragmatic, not just the crazy stuff, but how do you do translation of a web application with type safety, meaning how can I translate my web application and be guaranteed that all the sentences that I put, them, put there will be translated. So you can do that. And just almost to finish the, 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 the last uh, 60 seconds about my own personal functional programming journey slash what about Node.js. So about a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, I started with Elm, and that was the first time I was touching uh, func functional programming. And I, I must admit that up until then, I was looking, you know, looking at stuff like Symfony as the holy grail, you know, everything is object-oriented, and it's decoupled, and composition, and whatnot. And, Slowly I started realizing, yeah, it's awesome and great, it's beautiful, but the objects are mutable and they are holding states. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, it's just a completely different approach to solving, uh, to solving uh, the problem. And once I got into that, I told myself, okay, what about the backend? I'm not about to replace Drupal. I have a lot of respect for Drupal, also a lot of hatred to parts of Drupal, but still, it's doing a lot of, a lot of stuff. So on a, on a, not a typical, on a quite complex system, we might have like a headless Drupal, so we'll have a front-end in Elm, we'll have the Drupal itself acting as the headless Drupal, but oftentimes we have also like a Node.js proxy server. So the same problems I have in JavaScript on the client side, I'm, I'm starting to have with JavaScript on, on uh, Node.js. I've, uh, I've actually um, started to learn uh, Haskell, and this is a Yisod framework, which is really interesting. 
And even if we won't use it in production in the end in Gizra, and most probably we'll use it and we'll kick Node.js, there is a real value in learning something that is so completely different because I really got a kick in my uh, developer, developer's brain, and this has really shifted the way I'm looking at, at, uh, at, at development. It really changed my approach. And these were exactly 35 minutes and 60 seconds about Elm, and thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? You, you want to try the mic or? Sure. Oh, yeah, Alan, I'll let Pardon? The Elm, you're asking. So Elm is pretty stable in the sense that um, it's, still, it's still a new project in a sense that, uh, no, it's not a new project. It, I think it exists even more than React. It's a small, a small project. Uh, the maintainers are doing a terrific job in, you know, not breaking stuff on one hand and be very careful, but on the other hand, not being afraid on saying, okay, we should change that. I think what, I mean, uh, my best argument that I can give you is for my own company, I'm using Elm for in production. That's my, that's my argument. Yeah. Thank you. Daniel. Oh, hi. Um, so I was wondering how, how much of the, like the time do you spend with like the type checking and the types and at the same time like how is it for like people which are not familiar with for example object oriented code or something in general which is a little bit more high level than the typical procedural stuff um, because I could imagine that like for many people it's like a high barrier to even work on your projects. I'm wondering whether you run into any issues or can give some tips about that. So I think in a way you're asking also about the learning curve and yeah. bringing like junior developers and I have to admit uh, that this is actually became easier because when we're doing code reviews even for, G for junior developers, if, if it compiled, I'm already reassured. And it's actually, we're seeing it, it's much easier for them and in a way, kind of the nice side effect of Elm Part of our, uh, of our uh, job recruiting thing is we are giving people an Elm task. And it's guaranteed nobody knows Elm, so they don't know Elm. It's, it's a simple thing. Usually it's a counter, again, a glorified counter. And they make it. So it's, possi it's possible to do it. And another, another fun thing about it is, you know, when I was reviewing Angular's, uh, Angular web application, after two weeks, I lost it. I, do, I, I couldn't review it anymore, you know, banging my head at directive and transclude and crazy stuff. With that, even months after that, I can still easily review because I really understand the flow of the things. Yeah, last question. You mean a part of Elm using other other stuff? Yeah. So part of Headley. So Headley uh, basically shows uh, that Elm can have interop interoperability with JavaScript, which is kind of again this is outside of the world of Elm. Elm is a black box. So you could think about uh, about it as JavaScript as a service, right? So basically, Elm has ports. So it, this entire drag and drop. The maps, obviously I didn't write uh, all the leaflet maps from scratch. This is basically working from port. So Headley is really showing you all the use cases that you would, that you would uh, probably have. Uh, another question, is there any kind of focus regarding server-side rendering of Elm? So I know, it's, I know it's part of the plan. It hasn't been done yet, but uh, stay tuned. Okay. All right, that's the, really the last one. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I, <laughs> Make it count, dude. Uh, so with JavaScript, we have NPM, uh, and it's a really giant uh, ecosystem, uh, lots of well-written code. Uh, what does Elm have to offer for package management? All right. So first of all, there's, it, doesn't, it, it isn't as big as NPM with all the advantages and disadvantages. So I think in terms of you'd probably find higher quality stuff. You wouldn't see all the duplication. And a nice thing that since Elm is statically typed, so the package manager, if you try to push a change and you try to do like a minor change, it will tell you, dude, you cannot. It will, it will stop you because 
it knows how to go through your code and understand the API and will tell you this is a major change. So this is, I mean, you have a, a, lot, a, lot, of, a lot more guarantees on the stability, and this is one of the important things. You're getting a really, really stable web application. All right, folks, thank you very much.